And guys, here we go. So without animating this, we did previously, we brought it in as a series of transitions. Guys, this defines what we are going to do for the rest of chapter five um, and what we're going to do today. So, gang, we understand that the, the way that we're wrapping up chapter five is we're talking about where do these numbers come from? When we talk about thermochemical equations, how do we know how much energy is gained or lost? How much heat is gained or lost when a reaction takes place? And guys, last time we talked about doing this experimentally, empirically. We talked about calorimetry. Um, we did maybe answer a couple homework questions relative to this, but we'll look. is climb down the other side of this, this scaffold. So guys, what we're gonna do today is we're going to talk about not how do we find these delta H's experimentally, but how do we find these delta H's uh, mathematically? What you're going to find is that this all has to do with something called Hess's Law. So the way that today is going to unfold is first of all, I'm going to give you, I hope, and again, ask questions, a, a fundamental functional understanding of Hess's law. And guys, frankly, it's, it's really simple. It's a simple idea. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, first of all, how do we leverage Hess's law in order to figure out the energies involved in reactions through something we call manipulation. And you will see that on the AP test, they'll ask you to, and on our test, they'll ask you to do this. And how will you know if you're supposed to solve this through manipulation? Because the equations that they give you will force you to do it that way. But then guys, there will be other times that you will be doing a similar process based on the same concept that you'll do computationally and the AP authors will guide you towards one or the other based upon the information that you're given. So again, the idea is this, we're gonna talk Hess's law first, then we're going to talk about how to apply that first through manipulation, then through computation. You ready to go? Okay, so guys, Hess's law first. Here you go. Whether you write this down or not is up to you. But guys, I would read it before you start writing. Because I think if you read this, bless you. If you read this, I think you'll find it makes sense, maybe. It says, if a reaction can be broken down into a series of steps, the sum of the enthalpy changes associated with these steps will equal the enthalpy change of the complete reaction. If you'd like to write that down to have as a reference, that's fine. If you don't believe you need to, that's fine too. But guys, perhaps as you're either reading this or writing this down, you're saying to yourself, it kind of sounds familiar. So guys, what I'd like to do to help you better understand this is I would like to lay this out for you conceptually. Then I'd like to revisit how we've already thought about this chemically, and then we'll move on from there. You guys all caught up? You okay? Okay. So guys, I don't know if you want to write this down with me or not, but let me talk with you a little bit about next weekend. So how low do I go? I'll go here. So guys, this is I-15, okay? This is Linden. That would then make this Salt Lake City, and that would then make this where ducks live, okay? So for those of you that don't understand the importance of this, um, in next week, 
It's actually the first weekend in October. And what does that mean? The beginning of duck hunting season. And so guys, next weekend, you're gonna find Cody and I probably neck deep in, deep in a marsh, um, hopefully uh, shooting ducks. So next weekend, Cody and I have got to drive up to where ducks live if we're gonna go shoot ducks. Now guys, here's the problem. It's actually not a direct shot to get to where the ducks live. So the way you actually have to go to get to where ducks live, and this is kind of a mess, but guys, what you've got to do is you have got to drive all the way up to a place called, and Cody, I'm taking some liberties here. You've got to drive all the way up to a place called Brigham City. And once you get to Brigham City, then you've got to backtrack to an even smaller town called Corinne, which for a while was almost the capital of the state of Utah. And then you drive back a little bit further, and now you are actually at the, uh, the bird refuge, and that's where ducks live, and that's where we go to shoot ducks. Now, the question is this, how far is it from our house in Linden to where ducks live? And interestingly, I don't know the answer, but what I can tell you is this, from Linden to Brigham City is about 85 miles. And then from Brigham City to Corinne is about five miles. And then from Corinne to where ducks live is about two miles. So guys, how far is it from my house in Linden to where ducks live? Do you get the idea? So the idea is this. This entire journey all the way to Brigham City is 85 miles. But once we're in Brigham City, and it's ridiculous, we have to backtrack. So the first thing we do is we backtrack five miles to get to Corinne, and then we backtrack two miles in order to get to where ducks live, and that's our entire trip. So how far is it from the refuge to Linden? Well, it's 85 minus five minus two. Do you get the idea? So guys, this is Hess's Law in a nutshell. We actually don't need to know this distance. We can calculate that distance by knowing how far it is to get from point A to point B, even if the line isn't direct from point A to point B. But in order to do this, what is important to know? Direction. So as we work through this, we are counting this as a positive direction because we're moving towards our goal. But we go past our goal and we had to include these things as negatives. Guys, why did we include those as negatives? They were in the other direction. So guys, what does this have to do with thermochemistry? Endo and exothermic. Do you get the idea? So guys, this is all Hess's law says. If we understand the ins and the outs, and if we understand the magnitude of the ins and the outs, we can figure out overall changes by tracking the ins and the outs. You get the idea? You've seen this before though, right? How have we represented this before in chemical processes? Do you remember? Do you remember when we did things like this? And I don't remember the specific example but we said reactants, and didn't we go up to products, or up, and then didn't we go down? What was the, what did we, was it hydrogen? Oh, it was, never mind, I do remember. It was this, it was two hydrogens and one oxygen, and guys, we knew that our products were water, but what did we, ha what did we say had to happen for hydrogen and oxygen to make water? They had to break apart, right? So did that go energy up or energy down to break them apart? Energy up. So energy went up and we ended up with four hydrogens and two oxygens. And now we've got our atoms broken apart and we established that breaking atoms is always endothermic, right? Energy in to break things apart. And then we said, then the hydrogens and the oxygens bond together. And when they do, out of this came two water molecules and the formation of bonds is always 
exothermic, but then guys, we said that the overall reaction is exothermic. And understand, those are not always related. Breaking bonds is always endothermic. Forming bonds is always exothermic. But how do we know the whole reaction is exothermic? Exactly. It's this change. And because the products are below the reactants, the whole reaction is exothermic. Now understand, that doesn't have to be the case. The products could have been up here. Forming bonds is still exothermic, but if the, the bonds that are formed don't give off more energy than the energy that's taken in, the whole reaction is endothermic. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Are you sure? You're sure. Okay, so guys, do you see the connection between this and going duck hunting? You get the idea that it's all about distance. Here, let me get that out of the way. So guys, it is all about distance and it's all about direction. Does that sit okay? Okay, so guys, do you have questions about Hess's law? That settles? Okay. So guys, what you're gonna find then is we're gonna take this concept behind Hess's law and we are now going to use it in order to do some math. And you're going to learn to do this math through manipulation and you're going to learn to do this math through computation. And guys, we are going to handle these one at a time. So guys, write this down with me. Manipulation first. So you may even wanna title this Hess's law by manipulation. Hess's law by manipulation. And guys, I just want to give you what this would look like in homework or on the test. We're just going to solve one together. It says this, calculate the enthalpy of combustion of carbon to carbon monoxide. Scratch it down with me. This is worth writing down. Calculate the enthalpy of combustion of carbon to carbon monoxide. You okay? Okay, so guys, when you're given this, the first thing that you're going to want to do is write a balanced equation. So write the balanced equation for this process. But guys, what I'm going to ask you to do is write it right below the question with the understanding that you're going to be rewriting it in a minute. But write it down right now. Write the balanced equation for carbon the combustion of carbon to carbon monoxide. So let's do this together. So we've got carbon becoming carbon monoxide. What's missing? Oxygen. Oxygen is O2. And now we need to balance it. So Two oxygens, two oxygens, two oxygens. Does that sit okay? Okay, because guys, we're going to do something weird. Watch. Here's the deal. You guys talking things you probably should understand. You understand that when we talk about these enthalpies, and that's what we're solving for, right? We're trying to figure out delta H. That's our question mark. Guys, enthalpies change depending upon how much stuff we've got. Let me say that again. Guys, delta H changes depending on how much stuff we've got. So if we've got more carbon, we've got more energy, right? Do you remember that idea? Okay, now watch. Here's the problem. The question does not say calculate the enthalpy of combustion for two carbons. It says calculate the enthalpy of combustion for one carbon. And the problem is, is that we have it for two. So what do we do? Guys, we actually balance this equation differently. And here's how this goes. You probably don't have a problem with the idea that we've balanced the equation like that. But remember where we came from. We started here. Do this with me. We started here. And 
and then we added O2. And then what we did is we said, uh, let me make this a little smaller so I have space. Then guys, what we did is we said one carbon, one carbon, one carbon, two oxygens, one oxygen, so we put a two, so we put a two, right? That's not how we're going to balance this, and here's why. We want this equation to balance so that we don't have two carbons, we have one carbon. So how do we balance it? Like this. Oh, it's not. Absolutely, and you can certainly do that. So this is how we did it the first time, right? Divide everything by two, and you get two, or you get one and a half and two. Well, I was talking like at the end. No, the you could, yeah, you could, but don't. Yeah, you, you want to balance the equations like this. You don't want to have to do that at the end because things get weird. Yeah, do this, do, do it this way. So guys, when we write this balanced equation then, what we're going to do, and I'm just rewriting this to cut down on clutter, we're going to balance this equation like this. Is that okay? Okay. Now guys, here's the way the rest of this thing would go. They need to give us some information. Put this below your balanced equation. Write these down. But guys, hold on, actually stop. I'll do this with you. Let's do it together. So we've got C plus one half O2, and that yields CO. And then guys, this is the kind of information they'll give you, but hold on. Let's do this big, write, it, write them big. So we're gonna go C plus O2 yields CO2 delta H negative 393.5 kilojoules. And then we've got CO, uh, I'm gonna have to put this here, it's not gonna work. It's gonna get so low on the screen that you're not gonna be able to see it. So guys, I'm just gonna have to write it down. So we've got C plus O2 yields CO2 delta H is negative 393.5 kilojoules. And then guys, we've got CO plus one half O2. And this is the part that probably you didn't get to write down is CO2 and delta H is negative 283.0 kilojoules as written. Okay. So guys, what is this? Are y'all caught up with me? So what does this have to do with Hess's law? Well, guys, remind yourselves what we understand about Hess's law. Guys, Hess's law is all about magnitude and direction. And Hess's law is all about the idea that if we want to look, well, if we want to look at a journey, if we want to look at a journey, and if we can break that journey down into steps, and if we know the magnitude and direction of the steps, we can figure out what's going on in the journey, right? So guys, what does that idea have to do with this? Here's the answer. This is the journey and these are the steps. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to figure out how to get these steps to point in the right directions so that it adds up to the journey. And guys, doing that is what we call manipulation. Do you see the connections? So how do we do it? Guys, the answer is this. I'm gonna switch colors so this stands out. So guys, here's what you do. All you've gotta do is take your subject reaction and start to compare. And it goes like this. 
So guys, here we have a carbon atom. So we've got a carbon atom here, and then what we need to do is we need to find a carbon atom down in our journey, in, in our steps. Do we have a carbon atom down in our steps? Yeah. yeah. Now here's the question you need to ask. There's two questions. Is it on the right side, and is there, are there the right numbers of them? So carbon's on the left. Is carbon on the left? Yeah. Carbon's on the left. How many carbon atoms do we have there? One. How many do we have there? One. We're good. We've dealt with carbon. Now, guys, as you do this, skip oxygen. Oxygen tends to be everywhere. Just skip it and trust it's going to work. So now, guys, we look at the next substance, carbon monoxide. Now you've got to find carbon monoxide down in the thing below. Do you see carbon monoxide? But what's wrong with it? on the wrong side. So guys, what we've got to do is manipulate this thing. So I'm going to do this like this. And guys, what we're going to do is we're going to flip this over. Do this with me. We're going to flip this equation over. Hey guys, understand that when you yawn out loud like that, it's actually setting a tone in the room that says, I'm bored, I'm tired. And that attitude can propagate throughout the room. If you're tired now, that's fair. But keep that inside because that can actually be something that actually sets an improper tone in the room. So hang on to those sounds rather than feeling like that's an appropriate way to express your current condition to the entire room. So, guys, with that said, we now flip this thing over. And, guys, when we flip this thing over, what else changes? Because this is no longer synthesis. What is it now? It's a decomposition reaction. And when we flip the reaction, we also have to flip the sign. Okay. So I just made the negative positive. So guys, now that we've done this, we have now, to the best of our ability, manipulated our steps with the hope that it might add up to the overall equation, the journey. So now, guys, what you do is this. Draw a line. And now here's what you're going to do. I like to do this just because it helps me keep things straight. Draw a line through your yield signs. And now, guys, here's what you're going to do. Take your steps and bring down all the reactants. So we have a CO. We have a one-half O2. And we have a CO2. Sorry, I knew something wasn't flowing right. Okay, sorry, thank you. Let's do that again. We have a C, there we go. We have a C, we have an O2, and we have a CO2. Is that right? Yeah, yeah thank you. And then we do the same thing with products. And then, guys, over here, we have a CO2, we have a CO, and we have a one-half O2. Wait, how did, wait, what about the other, the blue one-half O2? Here? Yeah. This is, our, this is our journey. What we're adding up are the steps. So this is the... Well, we do because it's our goal. Eventually we want, and actually, Alice, it's interesting you're saying this because that's why, you know, I screwed that up a second ago. I was actually thinking to myself, do I need to explain why we're not doing this? And then I got distracted and did the addition wrong. So guys, you understand that this is what we're shooting for. And these are the steps that add up to what we're shooting for. But this one we flipped over. Now guys, watch what happens. We brought down the reactants we brought down the products, right? Now let's simplify. Carbon on the left, any carbon on the right? No. Oxygen on the left, any oxygen on the right? Half. So let's subtract a half 
from both sides. On the right is gone, on the left we're left with a half. Carbon dioxide on the left, carbon dioxide on the right, one of each. That cancels out. Now guys, look at what we're left with. Carbon plus half an oxygen yields carbon monoxide, which is the same as this. We just did Hess's law. We figured out how to make these steps get us from to our to to, to describe our journey. We were able to manipulate our steps so they add up to the journey. So guys, here's the idea. If the steps add up to our journey, then these will add up to the energy change for the journey. So now we have to add these up. And so, guys, we get negative, and signs are critical, y'all, negative 393.5 plus 283. And the answer is negative 110.5. Kilojoules. That is the answer. No, because if you look, the question was this. Calculate the enthalpy of combustion. And that is the enthalpy of combustion for this reaction. Go ahead, come. Help me understand what you're thinking. Yeah, so let's talk. So there's several other things that you're going to see. Um, I'm going to change to a color that stands out kind of ridiculously. So they always don't work out this simple. But notice what we did. Why did we change the sign of that value? Because we had to flip it over, right? So if we had just taken this and this and added them together, we would have been wrong because we wouldn't have known that Nat needed to flip over. But it actually, guys, gets worse than that. And Cody, I'm glad that you're thinking, couldn't we make this more simple? But what, and guys, this isn't true, but watch. What if this balanced, I don't know, what if this balanced with a two right here? Let me put that somewhere else. What if this balanced with it, and it doesn't, but what if our subject reaction, our journey, what if that balanced with a two? Well, then as we're looking at our steps, we would go, okay, the carbon is on the right side, but we need two of them. So what we would have had to have done is double all of this, but what else do we need to double? The energy. So guys, understand that that, Cody, is why it's important that you do all of this because doing this will not only tell you which ones have to flip and therefore change signs, it also tells you if you need to multiply any of these in order to make them add up to the equation. Is that okay? Does that make sense, y'all? Was that your question? Okay. So, so guys, this is called Hess's Law by Manipulation. Any questions? You guys good? Okay, then we're going to do this computationally next. So let me clean up this mess and go here and go here. Okay, so guys, before we can get into doing this computationally, there's a term that I need to share with you. They're called enthalpies of formation. Put this in your notes. So guys, in order to do Hess's law computationally, you need to know what are called enthalpies of formation. So let me define it for you and then we'll talk. So an enthalpy of formation, not surprisingly from the name, is this. An enthalpy of formation is the change in energy, enthalpy heat, delta H, for a reaction 
that forms one mole of a compound from its component elements. Write it down, and then when you're done writing it down, read it a couple times, and then quietly in your brain answer this question. What kind of reactions are these? Please don't say anything. But what kind of reaction are we referencing? Again, read it a couple times, and then ask yourself, what kind of reaction are we referencing here? Did you get it? You're still writing. You okay? Okay. So guys, can you picture it? Heats of formation, enthalpies of formation. By the way, those are the same. Heat and enthalpy we'll use interchangeably. So guys, enthalpies of formation is the amount of energy that is involved when one mole of a compound is, is exchanged in forming a mole of that compound from its component elements. So, what kind of reactions are we talking about? Synthesis reactions, okay? So, with that said, we abbreviate this delta H naught sub F. Now, guys, for those of you that are not familiar with that little circle, that is not a degree symbol. That is actually, in science, read as the word not, K-N-O-T. And, guys, in science, not references a set of conditions. For these, the not symbol indicates standard conditions which are pure substances at, at, at 25 Celsius, about room temperature, and one atmosphere of pressure. Now guys, understand for us it doesn't matter because everything that we're going to do will be at standard conditions. But technically, you need to include that information because if temperature or pressure changes, these values change. So we just define it like that. You guys all caught up with me? Okay, so do this. Your books are open to page 1,000 something, right? Um, put a pencil in there or something like that. And guys, open up your books, change pages to page 184. Y'all on page 184? Yes. All right. So guys, looking at page 184, table 5.3, this is a table of standard entropy, enthalpies of formation, delta H naught sub F, they gave you the temperature. So guys, notice that this table actually should be twice as tall and half as wide. It wraps around substance formula and then data and then substance formula data, they just spread it out wide. But guys, let me give you a second to look this over. What do you notice? What's interesting? What's contradictory? What's troubling? Let me give people the opportunity to look. Because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. Because let me give you another couple seconds, and then what I'd like to do, and we're going to have a conversation about this, but I fear that some of you may not actually know what we're looking at. So I want to make sure you know what we're looking at before we get there. So guys, let's do this because this is familiar. Um, look at ammonia. Second one down. So what on earth does this mean? Let me explain to you what this means. So ammonia, oh, I don't like that color. So guys, ammonia is NH3. Ammonia is formed through the reaction of N2 
and H2. <laughs> You're going to hate this. So guys, ammonia is formed through the reaction of N2 and H2. What we're given is the delta H. And what's the number? <laughs> 46 point what? Thank you. Kilojoules. Oh, all right. But guys, how much ammonia gives off that much energy? One mole. So, Alice, this is back to your question. Couldn't we just balance it right and then fix it later? No, and here's why. This is the amount of energy that's given off when one mole of ammonia forms, but this isn't balanced. And we're not going to mess around with this because we want this to be one. So if that's one, this has got to be one half, and this has got to be three halves. I know, but that's how we balance it. So guys, that is what this table means. The formation of ammonia from its component elements. And guys, notice that nitrogen and oxygen are in their elemental forms. They're diatomic. So the formation of ammonia from its component elements, half a mole of N2, a mole and a half of H2, releases this many kilojoules of energy when it forms. You good? All right. So now, guys, with that baseline understanding, what did you find interesting in the table? Yeah. Ooh, and, and most of them are negative, right? Now, guys, we need to talk about why. And what... Is... What does that mean? So from the example that we have on the board, maybe it makes sense that, that this is negative. But guys, here's the thing you've got to understand and think through this with me. So guys, when we form compounds, think through this with me. When we form compounds, are bonds formed or are bonds broken? They are formed. And when bonds form, does energy go in or out? Energy goes out. So guys, most of, so if energy is going out, what would we expect delta H to be? Negative, right? Let's, are we sure? So the idea is this, these are en enthalpies of formation. Formation is bond formation. Bond formation releases energy and consequently energy is going out, right? These should all be negative. But guys, what does it mean that some of these are positive? What are possible explanations? Which bonds? Of the reactants, right? So perhaps it's because these bonds take more energy to break than those bonds release when it's formed. Doesn't that make sense? It's wrong. That is not why. Guys, that is not why. Here's, the, and I love that you, guys, we're not going to talk about why. No, 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 we're not. And the reason that we're not going to talk about why, because you all ain't read chapter 19. We can't talk about why because we have not done chapter 19. But the thing, and Addy, I love that you said that. But guys, what we are going to say is this. These values are not positive because it takes a lot of energy to break the bonds in nitrogen and hydrogen. As a matter of fact, and guys, write this down. When we do the accounting, all of the diatomics are assumed to have heats of formation of zero. What that means is when we do the energy accounting, we assume that it takes no energy to break the bonds in the diatomic molecules. Um, we're going to talk more in chapter 19. But for our accounting purposes, it's zero. But 
But guys, did you also notice that in the table there are none? Of, there's no H2, N2, O2, Br2, Cl2. None of the diatomics are in the table. It's not an oversight. They don't have values. They are understood to have heats of formation of zero. Yeah. So, so why, are, why is the diamond on the table? Yeah. Because it's pretty. So, so it's C going to C no, it's it's actually not. What else? Yeah, yeah, and we're and that's why you were on the thousand whatever, right? Because there's a bigger table with more information. So the idea is this, Robbie, and everybody: um, carbon and graphite are both pure substances. They're elements. They're different. What are called allotropes of carbon, different forms of carbon. But the trick is, is this: carbon atoms exist as unbonded species, independent of others, but they then bond together to form graphite or diamond. And it's those formations of bonds that actually are what's going on relative to energy. When they organize like this, it's diamond. When they organize like this, it's graphite. And the difference is, is that when these things form, energy is exchanged, and that's the energy that we're talking about. So then the question interestingly becomes, and we're not going to talk about this for about six weeks, no, more than that. But here's the deal. This is a molecule. Diamond is a molecule, but it is actually a molecule that is as big as the diamond. Yeah, so diamond is actually a, it's a macro scale molecule. We call it a covalent network solid. We're going to talk more later. But the diamond molecule is actually as big as the diamond. Graphite, that's not true. In, in graphite, which is in the middle of your pencil, um, the graphite actually exists in sheets, which you may know is called graphene. Um, it's at that point where we don't define the molecule as being the entire guts of your pencil, because it's not, because the sheets are held together with intermolecular forces. But both of the formation of both of these involves an exchange of energy, which is quantified in that table. So that's the idea. So guys, you good on that table? Okay, then do this. Um, let's do this right now. Oh, wait, there's one other I wanted to talk about. Did you notice that water comes up twice? Yeah, can we talk? So what's the difference in the energy? The states, right? One is a liquid and one is a gas. But guys, we're talking about the formation of gas and liquid. And so in order for the gas to become a liquid, what has to happen? Is energy lost or gained? Gas to liquid. And that accounts for their differences in energy. Um, the difference in that energy is actually what we call the heat of vaporization. It's the amount of energy that is, um, that is exchanged as the gas becomes the liquid or vice versa. So that's why they're different is because of the amount of energy gained or lost as they change phase. Okay, so guys, with that said, let me do this. So we need the heat of formation of uh, liquid water. So guys, let's get the heat of formation of liquid water off of this table. Just write it down somewhere in your notes. I need to write it down too. So guys, the heat of formation of liquid water is what? Negative 285.8. OK. Now, guys, turn back to 1,000 whatever. What is it? 1,059. OK. No, no, you don't need to. It's not, I believe it's not back there. That's why. I'm yeah, it's not there. OK, but we're good. Oh, is it there? Oh, really? I just. <laughs> I've never been able to find it. I pray that the numbers match up. It's under oxygen? They do? I can't even find oxygen. So why is it not before potassium? Oh, 
Thank you. There we go. All right. Okay. So, guys, same game, different rules. For those of you that are really connecting with what we're doing, you're going to have a really, really interesting aha moment about 10 minutes. We good on all of this? Yeah. All right, here we go. So guys, what I need you to do, what you need you to do is um, skip down in your notes four lines. And then guys, write down these four synthesis reactions. You know, more space is always better than less space. It is a typo, sorry. Are the rest of them okay? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for oh gosh. Thank you for catching that. And guys, you'll notice the way that I balance these. They're all balanced in terms of one mole of product. And these are all synthesis reactions. Therefore, are you guys done writing them down? Therefore, we can get See, you guys read the delta is an A and M cat. So I just wrote it that way here. There we go. Guys, because these are all written as synthesis reactions and because they're all balanced in terms of one mole of product, where on earth could we go to find the delta H's? In the heat of formation table. So guys, we already know water, negative 285.8. Well, we looked it up because we need it, but. So now, guys, let's get the rest of them. So calcium chloride. So heat of formation, negative 795.8. You're scaring me. Negative 795. And guys, forgive me if I don't put units on them, but we're just going to simplify a little bit. Okay, so our next one then is calcium hydroxide. Negative 986.2. Okay. Did you find it under hydrogen? Under chlorine. under chlorine. Is it on that first page? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to use it as aqueous. So negative 167.2. And again, guys, I left off units for simplicity's sake. So this is starting to feel familiar, right? We've got equations for which we have delta H's. And in addition to that, 
we have a subject reaction. Write it above and write it big. He should have skipped a little space. Cody, I think that this is going to bring out in greater contrast the question that you asked a second ago. So guys, if you have the luxury of being able to change colors, now might be a good time to do that. Because guys, what we're going to do, and I know you feel like we're moving forward, but we're actually going to go backward. We are going to figure out the delta H for this reaction by manipulation. Join me. So guys, how do we do this? Well, we start on the left and we start with the first substance, which is HCl. We find it in our subject reactions. But now we have, don't write until you see this, think with me. Now we have two things to fix. What's wrong with our HCl? It's on the wrong side and there ain't enough of them. So guys, here's what we're going to do. And this, this would be a better way to do this on the test. Flip the reaction. You can just do that. And guys, this would be dangerous if you did this on the test, right? Because if, and you're going to find out we're not actually going to solve this by manipulation. You'll see. But if we were solving it by manipulation, why would it, oh gosh, why would, why would it be dangerous to just flip the arrow over? Because then when you went to add up things top to bottom, it would still be on the wrong side. You know what I'm saying? But we're going to leave it for now and you'll see why. But guys, when we flip that, what else do we have to flip? The sign. So that dealt with the wrong side issue. Now we've got to deal with the not enough issue. And to do that, we would double everything. But when we double that, what else do we double? The enthalpy change. Yeah. If you were doing this by manipulation, it would definitely be wrong. Because if you were to just put a two here and not double those, they would never add up to the overall reaction. You have to double everything. Okay. But again, we're cutting some corners here, Addy, because we're actually never going to add these up. Okay. okay, but let's keep going. So now, guys, we get to calcium chloride. How many problems do we have to solve? One, it's on the wrong side. We've got the right number. It's just on the wrong side. So we've got to flip it over, which changes the sign. Now, guys, let's go on to the next one. Calcium chloride. How many problems do we have to solve? None. It's on the right side, and we've got the right number. So, guys, now what about the water? How many problems do we have to solve? One. It's on the right side. We just ain't got enough. So we're going to do this. Now, guys, you're just going to have to trust me on this because I don't want to spend the time to do it. But if we had actually taken these two reactions and flipped them, and if we had multiplied everything by the twos, and if we add all these up, you're just going to have to trust me, all of these flipped and multiplied would in fact add up to this. It does work. And because that works, what do we know that we can do with these? Add them all up, and what would it give us? The energy of the reaction. Do you buy it? Watch this. Guys, this is where this gets really good. Guys, do this with me. Draw a squiggly line right here. This gets good. Guys, what does that squiggly line separate? What does it separate? The reactants from the products. Now, guys, what I want you to do is this. Look at the reactants 
in this system, in this reaction. Guys, given these, and remember, what are these called? Formations. Guys, for these formations, what did you have to do with both of these to make them work overall? Flip them over. Why? Why did we have to flip the formations over for the first two? Because are reactants formed in reactions? What are reaction? What are reactants? They're consumed in reactions. Huh? So guys, if these reactions represent the production of something, and if reactants are not produced, but they're consumed, does it make sense that we'd have to flip these over in order to represent what's taking place because reactants are not produced, they're consumed? Does that make sense? Now, guys, functionally, what did that mean we had to do? We had to change the signs of these numbers. Does that make sense? Now, guys, what other adjustments did we have to make? Well, we had to multiply this by 2, and we had to multiply that by 2. Why did we have to do that? Because there's 2's in the balanced equation. So hold on a second. You're telling me that if I have the heats of formations, check this out, you're telling me that if I have the heats of formations for all of the things in a reaction, all that I have to do is take the reactants and flip them over and then take the coefficients and multiply everything through and when I do that everything adds up to the energy of the reaction? That is exactly what I'm telling you. And guys, that is what this equation means. Write it down. Just write it down. Delta H naught reaction is equal to squiggly E and delta H naught sub F products minus squiggly E N delta H naught sub F reactants. Write it down. Think, think process, process, write it down. Not yet. Just write, Just write it down. So guys, so guys that, that equation, equation that you just, just wrote, wrote down, down is this. Is this. And, we, and, and we don't, don't need it. Well, let's do it. Let's do it. Oops, oops. Is that, is that, there, there it is. That equation, that equation you just, just wrote down is, down is this. this. So guys, so guys help me help make, you make action actions. What, what things, things did we have, we have to fix? fix? What did we what have to do to the reactants? Flip them all over. over. And when and we when do, what did that do to the, the sign? Change the sign. What did the other thing we have to do to fix? We had to multiply by the coefficients in order to make the numbers of things line up. Now guys, that is exactly what this says. So guys, where, let me zoom in, where in this equation does it say multiply by the number of molecules in the balanced equation? That's N. Those N's are your coefficients. Now guys, check this out. Where in this equation does it say change the sign for the heats of formations of the reactants because they're being consumed and not created? The negative sign. Guys, this thing that looks like a subtraction is actually a change the sign. 
Because remember when you learn that magic thing that multiplying by negative changes the sign of something? That's why we subtract the reactants, because the reactants are not being created, they're being consumed. And because the data that we have is based upon heats of formation, the reactants are not formed, they're consumed, and therefore we change the sign. And so guys, we don't need to go through this mess in order to figure out these numbers. All we need is these numbers and we multiply by the coefficients and we change the signs of the reactants and add them all up and that gives us delta H. You see the connection? Alice, what's your question? Are we still talking about entropy formation or are we already talking about So all of this is based upon enthalpies of formation. That's what these are. Yeah. Okay, so guys, try this on for size. Ready? Here's what it says. We're going to do this together, and this is our day. It says, calculate the standard enthalpy change for the combustion of one mole of benzene to create carbon dioxide in water. It's a combustion reaction. Now, guys, I'm going to be honest with you as you're writing these down. These problems are a pain in the butt. The reason they're a pain in the butt is because you're, like, you're going to be, like, probably 3 to 11 times you're going to need to get more lead out of your pencil because it's like your hand's going to fall off your writing so much. Don't cut corners. You ready? Let's solve this. We're going to do it together. So, guys, C6... H6. Can you picture it? You built it during lab last year, this circles stop sign. Okay, so I'm just going to say it. We need carbon dioxide or oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. Now, guys, we've got to balance this thing. <laughs> this is hard. We've got to balance this thing in reference to one mole of C6H6. Can I make a suggestion? Don't try. Um, six carbons, one carbon, put a six. Six hydrogens, three hydrogens, put a three. Now we can actually make this work. So how many oxygens do we have over here? Well, here's 12, 15. So now we can just go right here. Yeah, 15 halves. All right. Now, guys, here's the way this goes. Grab your AP equation sheets. Go to the side of your AP equation sheet that says thermochemistry, thermodynamics and electrochemistry. The equation that you are looking for is obviously the third one down, but what is missing from the form that I shared with you? The ends. They, for some reason on the AP sheet, assume that you know the ends should be there. They assume that you know that the ends, they assume that you know the ends should be there. So they will not expect you to include the ends in your equation, but they will expect you to use them because they got to be there. So, guys, this is the sheet that you'll have on the test. So we're going to do this. Here's what the solution looks like. So we're going to go delta H naught is equal to the sum of the heats of formation naught of pro products 
minus the sum of the heats of formation of reactants. Great. Okay. So now, guys, this is where you're going to fight this. Don't. Delta H is equal to products first. Big parentheses, 6 times the heat of formation of carbon dioxide. Plus... That's what we're doing is we're summing. Plus 3 times the heat of formation of water. Close your parentheses. Minus big parentheses. Now we need reactants. The heat of formation, forgot my knots. The heat of formation of C6H6 plus the heat of formation uh, oh, oh, sorry, forgot my coefficient, 15 halves the heat of formation of O2. Now we need numbers. Is equal to 6 times the heat of formation of carbon dioxide, CO2, negative 393.5, again looking in appendix C, negative 393.5 kilojoules, plus 3 times the heat of formation of um, liquid water. What do you want to do? They will tell you on the test. What do you want to do? Doesn't matter. What do you want to do? Let's make it vapor. We can do whatever we want. We're in charge. Where's it at? Vapor water, negative 136.1. No? Oh, sorry. That's No, that's right. Oh, that's hydrogen peroxide. Never mind. Uh, gas. You guys want gas? Negative 241.82. Negative 241.82 kilojoules minus the quantity benzene. Is that under carbon? Uh, yeah, liquid or gas. <laughs> you pick. Let's go gas. Positive 82.9. Kilojoules. Guys, this is the best part of the whole thing. Plus 15 halves times zero. Sure. So six times 393.5, and that's negative. Guys, at this point when you're poking your calculator, slow down. Take your time. Three ninety three point five times six and then two forty one point yeah I ran it twice though and I didn't get exactly the same number. No, that's right. Two 
And guys, check me on this, but I get three, no. I get negative 3,169. No, it actually shouldn't. Because we're subtracting, we can serve decimal places. So it should be negative 3169.4. Um, to be honest with you, if you didn't have it, you would be okay because you would be within one significant digit of the correct answer. Um, but the answer to your question, Alice, is anytime you're subtracting, you get the same number of decimal places as the fewest decimal places in your setup. So, Jace, are you stretching or are you? Okay. Okay, so guys, here's where we are. Here, here's where we are. Um, so we're done with chapter five. We have now looked as deeply as we're going to into enthalpy changes. In lab, you know that we're going to be pursuing enthalpy more deeply um, experimentally. Um, but in terms of what we're doing in the larger class, we are now done with enthalpy. You understand how to pursue enthalpy through calorimetry. You understand how to pursue enthalpy through manipulation. You also now understand that there's another way for us to calculate enthalpy. But it's neat that I think you see that this process is very, very much based on manipulation. But the manipulation. Good day, Tigers. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. The manipulation of equations that are actually these special things that we call formation reactions. So, guys, what we're going to do when we get together after the weekend is we are going to open up a whole nother can of worms. Uh, this gets crazy. Guys, we are going to jump into chapter 19 and the conversation is going to change radically because what we understand right now is this. Some reactions like this one give off energy. And what you're going to find out is that because these reactions give off energy, they happen on their own. Guys, imagine a ball sitting at the top of a hill. When you let go of that ball, what's it do? Rolls down. Why? Because it's losing energy. But guys, if you've got a ball at the bottom of a hill, does it ever roll up? Can it? Well, yeah, if we push it, but it never happens on its own. And guys, as a result, we're going to talk about this idea that reactions that lose energy happen on their own. Understanding of energy and energy exchange, all you've got is heat. If reactions give away heat and therefore feel hot, like a Bunsen burner burning, it happens on its own. But guys, hydrogen and oxygen never come together to make Bunsen burner gas. And that's true. But guys, sometimes these things can happen. And they're still losing energy. It's just not a kind of energy that you've ever thought of before. That's what chapter 19 is all about. So guys, this is your homework. This is your homework. So you've already seen this. But guys, in addition to these problems, you must, must, and guys, understand I'm not going to let you get away with you doing it your way. 
you must summarize chapter 19 the way I've showed you. Four quadrants for every subsection of the chapter. Don't feel compelled to fill in all four quadrants for each subsection, but this is the way that you are going to address this material. It's going to be a lot of pages because chapter 19 is long. It goes to 19.7. Four pages. <laughs> 